Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Doll Week. We are here at the Grovian. I am here with Michael Canadis. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Ruby Lane. Everybody out there, you, if you guys are tuning in, we are in a very special place of the museum. It is called the Ladies' Corner. So yesterday, we did a wonderful seminar on the child babies and uh, the child-sized dolls that were about, not size, but age, and about 12, right. 12 years old or, or children. under, the children yeah. dolls. So now we are in the ladies corner, which is going to be a wild ride. We are very, very excited. Michael, tell us about this corner of the museum and a little that we're gonna kind of see in our uh, yeah. overview. Yes, this, this whole room we call the gold room. It's, it's one of the biggest rooms in, in the building and it can seat up to 40 people um, theater style. When we have presentations and the screen drops from the, the ceiling Normally there is not things like this dollhouse in the middle of the room, but, but it's here on a special exhibit and I think tomorrow David is going to talk to you about the dollhouses. But it, back in this corner are our lady dolls um, and some of them with wardrobes. And if you can look up above, most of those trunks are filled with the trousseaus of these dolls. So quite a few of them have trousseaus. So this is going to be really fun and exciting, and if you guys like fashion, if you like miniatures, if you like French dolls, fist dolls, pretty much anything, share this video live so other people can tune in live and see it happening right now. You guys can ask questions and get really involved and have some fun. So, Michael, start us off at your... Well, I think we could start here, and here's a nice little shelf of brew dolls. Um, and if you notice the background, there's an illustration, and it's actually the, the, the lid of a brew box. And we love original source material and ephemeral material. So what you can learn from this brew box is invaluable. What you have is you can see what they were marketing in about 1868. So you have laying in the center, is the brew with the wooden articulated body. Next to her is the brew with the leather body with the articulated arms. Then we have a brew with leather arms with a chemise and of course heads. Wonderful. So what this tells us is that this is what how they marketed their dolls. But what's really interesting about this group here, so we have the leather body with bisque arms, we have the two with just the leather arms. And what's interesting about these is these have um, um, linen bodies with leather arms. Mm. And the fancy dressed dolls, that's the kind of bodies that they had. So that that way they weren't wasting the money on the doll body because all the money was put into the costuming of it. But here's the really jewel of the brew group, and that's an original brew mannequin. And she is she is life size. She is life size, and I should show you, even though this is a G-rated channel, but <laughs> you know they're natural and beautiful, and um, oh, she, that's wonderful though. That yes, it's just it's, it's, it's such a rare rare feature yes. on a doll. Yes. And these these were not. This was a piece that would have gone into a jewelry store mm -hmm. or a hat um, shop. This would have not been some, would not have been marketed mm -hmm. to children. And how many of these are known in existence? I think I've counted about three of them. And the one thing about when you try to say how many numbers rare things are, sometimes dolls go into the witness protection program. Mm -hmm. So they change, their identities <laughs> change and they get counted more than once. So you kind of have to think about that, that, you know, I mean, there's certain dolls that I am, you know, interested in how many there are, but let's face it, there are not many of them. Right. I mean, there just really are not. I have never seen one before. She is absolutely well, I mean, there captivating. There is the reproduction, which is lovely, the, the Lady Grace, and it's, you know, there's some artists that can really do a beautiful job recreating them. But you know what? It's not the same as the real thing. No. There's just something about it, the eyes. And of course, they can't reproduce the mauve shadow. They don't know how they actually did that. And they come close, but not exactly. Wow. It's kind of like they didn't... The, 
the Egyptians that built the pyramids, they still don't know how they did that. Some, yes, yes, and, <laughs> and, and, and I guess they'll figure it out at some point, but for now they don't know. Now these and, two wonderful dolls, we used a lot in the um, yes, advertising of being here. And, and, and I, should, I should point out something too. Do you know, I, both David and I don't really put anything into the museum unless we feel that it's, it's the way it should be. And we have to be realistic that an old item, they're not always perfect. And like, for instance, this, this doll had really six solid weeks of conservation to the costume. Mm. Now, that six solid weeks cost some serious money, almost to the point that you think, is, it, is the dress worth that amount of, of, of labor, cost of labor, to repair it? But you know what? In a way, it's irreplaceable. So you do it, even though it, it, the cost, you know, it makes the, the cost on the doll, you know, crazy. But, I mean, look at... But now we get to enjoy yeah, this and, yeah, every and everybody gets to enjoy it. Every piece of was repaired and um, every little ball was reattached. And, you know, that takes a lot of time. And actually, really, people, you know, our, our beauty department, our conservation department... They're very devoted in getting everything just right. If you guys are just tuning in, we are here live at the Grovian, and you are closer than somebody if they were here because my camera is actually inside the doll case. We are in the hood. We are in the hood. In the brew hood. Yeah, you're in the brew hood. And this so is a wonderful. really a wonderful. Small. Small, tiny little thing. And just a wonderful little costume. This costume, I have seen it and had it in blue and in pink. Wow. So this would be their dress doll, which would have been a, um, you know, a, a, an extra special price point. Um, just as then, really, as it is now, if a doll in a great costume would have cost more than a doll that was nude or in a chemise. So you would pay almost twice the price. And kind of in a way, if you think about it. We still do. We still do. <laughs> yeah, we still do. And... Um, but I think let's move on to this area too, because this is one of my, there's kind of a few special things in this cabinet. One is, this really is the tiniest French fashion doll that I know of. Look at my hand, she's not, she's not much bigger. Well, she's what, eight inches maybe? Maybe eight inches. Wonderful. And it's, you know, she's not the most beautiful doll in the world. But I just could not resist seeing this little tiny, she's like a little bug, you know, just a little tiny little bug. But she's really not my favorite in the cabinet. And if you look at it, this you would think would be my favorite because it's got a spectacular dress and um, um, by the Simone company, just a spectacular Come dress. Come on over, ladies. <laughs> my favorite is this doll. And she's she wonderful. was... Um, She's from the order of um, St. Vincent de Paul. And that doll traveled all over the world and visited different uh, missionaries. And, and just she just has a, a serene look to her. And our buying her, say, I really, I think, our buying her saved her from being a fancy lady. Mm -hmm. From because, being turned into a fashion. To, yeah, turned turn, turn into a, you know, a, a floozy. <laughs> so, so she... Uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of documentation on the doll. But one of the things that I thought was really fun is in the 1950s, she went to a Catholic girls reform school for, you know, bad Catholic girls. And they, <laughs> they recreated part of her habit. And I think it's kind of neat that, you know, that history from then to now. Mm -hmm. But it's just, she She's packs... Wonderful. If you're sensitive, she packs a powerful punch of, you know, some of these beautiful faces, you know, were dressed for occupations, such mm -hmm. as being a nun, um, uh, um, a fishmonger, uh, you know, different things that they would, would have done for, to, to, to live. And one thing, too, that both David and I find irresistible is I love original advertising piece. Oh, those are original. Wow. This is an original card from Turin. Look at that. The Turin shop. 
and this was when they were they were on uh, the Rue de Rivoli, which if you've if you haven't been to Paris, the Rue de Rivoli is a, a large street that runs near the Louvre, the Louvre, and it's one of like the most important shopping districts in Paris. So if you went to that shop in the 1860s and 70s, you could just pick up one of these cards and it would have different dolls or toys. Here you have a French fashion doll in a chemise, which in a chemise would basically be a nude doll. Un underwear. Yeah, mm -hmm, yes. but it would be considered nude. Considered so nude. you would then dress it yourself. And one thing about these little things that are important is when you see them, you realize what um, what what kind of original clothes mm. it should look like. This outfit is just to die for. This is really to die for. And this was in the uh, Countess Marie Tronowska's collection. And, oh, 25 years ago, you know, or many years after that, I, I admired it in her collection. And then recently she sold off quite a few things and we were lucky to get this. Wonderful. So, and I always believe that, you know, there's no reason to be envious of someone else's beautiful things, enjoy them. And if you're very, very patient, <laughs> eventually you get them. How do you do the swoop? Well, I kind of go in <laughs> when the time goes. <laughs> we love As it. As part of being a culture vulture, not only are you swooping <laughs> up the information, occasionally you get a nice little tidbit. So Love it, um, love it, love but it. But one thing too that the Grovian has quite a few of in many different categories are uh, dolls with wardrobes Look and accessories because we do love dolls with wardrobes. And, um, you know, this one is really very special. It's kind of an unusual piece. It's um, a maker, uh, has a maker's mark on it that I have no, absolutely no documentation off of it. And did you notice that she has a little poodle she like Murray? She has a poodle like Murray and yes. he is wonderful. Yes, oh, look at older that. Than, way older than Murray. <laughs> And um, she has wonderful little oh, things. Uh, but one of my favorite pieces that she has, Rachel, is if you notice, she has her school portfolio from 1860. Wow. And so, so that's kind of neat to have that. Now, all of this came together yes. when you acquired mm -hmm. her? Yes. Yes. And, and what kind of doll is that? It's, it's probably a China Blampois, but the maker of the body is an unknown maker. And uh, right now I can't... Um, tell you off the top of my head, but I did write an article about it. And the one thing is, as I said yesterday about embroidering a pillow, um, <laughs> and I forgot what I was going to embroider on it. We've been doing this long enough that I occasionally I have to read my own articles. So that's, <laughs> I'd have to read up to tell you what it says on our body, but I will explain it. It's a very unusual pink body, and you don't see that normally at this period in time. So sometimes, you know, there were little like startups in the computer business. There were startups probably in the doll business that didn't work out. You know, they had a little kiosk where they could sell things and it didn't, it didn't work out. Well, but the doll survived. She's wonderful. And yes, it's certainly a, uh, referencing your own article is not a bad thing. That's well, a great I mean, thing. It, it's, <laughs> I do have to read it. You know, I've talked many times about Rose Percy and you think that I'd always remember everything, but we do have to read the book that we wrote to, you know, to be prepared. To, right. What is the style of bonnet or hat that's on her? That would be called a, a, a hooded capelet. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, but it's done with suit, a soutache trim, which, you know, that would have been um, an expensive little piece because in the 19th century, they valued really good sewing mm -hmm. and work. And then, of course, this is this was expensive too. This iridescent silk, and um, it doesn't always survive. Um, it can go bad. Although it's an early era where silk was still pretty good, but um, this was played with and then put away. I think it's had more exposure here than it probably had when the little girl played with it. And this this one may have been a Sunday doll. A Sunday doll. Mm -hmm. And do you know about Sunday? I, I have we do a not. Wonderful, um, I got a wonderful example of how French dolls were played with by Barbara Cartland. 
And if you don't know who she is, she, she was, I think, the aunt of Princess Diana. And she was a very famous romance novelist that was very flamboyant, had bouffant hair, and always wore pink. Her signature color was pink. But she was born at the dawn of the 20th century. And she can tell us how a French doll was handled. When she would be invited to tea as a little girl, her governess would hand her her French doll, give it to her. She would sit and play with the French doll during tea when the guests were there. The guests left, she handed the French doll back to the governess and the governess put it away. Because if she broke mm. the doll, the cost of the doll came out of the governess's pay. Oh, so French, wow. doll, French dolls were expensive then and, and desirable. And uh, ex uh, desirable and, uh, and somewhat expensive now, especially in these yes, wonderful wardrobes. But it's not that much, honestly, it's not that much different if you really think about what people earned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these were expensive items. But here's the difference between then and now. They valued quality much, much more mm -hmm. than uh, the current um, population. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and they looked at everything as a oh, you can tell examined how it was made. And this is we have to get down for this. We're going to get down in here. This is a wonderful portrait oh, show. Good. And Samantha, does this get a little shorter? We're going to try and yeah. She's just fabulous. Well, this is a very. This doll was from a home in Philadelphia, and. In a way, it's got a lot of American sensibilities to it, this doll. Uh, American style workmanship in the, in the clothes. And if you notice there, there's a little photograph of the doll when she was young. Yeah, and there's some really great, great pieces. And one thing too that's great about dolls is a lot of the undergarments that are missing, you know, in real life because they went out of fashion and they got rid of them. Here we have a Look at muscle pad, and that's to keep the shape of the dress. And then we have a wired muscle pad here. And there's some very, very special items. And you can learn a lot from you can learn a, so a, a, much. a wardrobe doll. And then it has the original tissue paper from the store that it came from. Don just commented and said, have you considered writing a book, and would you please? <laughs> well, we have written... You know, lots have, of articles. We've written lots of articles, and we, of course, wrote the Rose Percy book, and we've edited uh, the journal uh, Tell Me a Story, and we, you know, we have some plans to do books, but you know what? Time goes by fast. Right. I mean, I don't know where the last 35 years have gone. <laughs> you know, it's just gone. It does. And so we do, you know, we do plan on doing things like that. Usually, I'll to be honest, is if we've made a commitment and we have a deadline, then we get it done. Right. But it's not like we don't do anything. You know, we do. <laughs> You're not sitting around eating bonbons. No, we're not. Speaking of sitting around eating bonbons, is this a doll that might? <laughs> she might because, you know, I mean, here we've got two shelves wow. of, of hirays and they're both China hirays. So these are the earliest hirays that they made. And both of them have the first generation gutta percha bodies and the china heads, and that's Emily. And Emily's just a visitor here. She uh, belongs to one of our um, board members and one of the members of our club, Denise Bisi, who you know is a, a past editor of Doll News and a fabulous doll couturier. Yes. And this is her doll, Emily, that came just came to visit and at some point she's going to go home but so I, we have really enjoyed having Emily here she is and she alone. has incredible look clothes. at this incredible clothes incredible shoes a beautiful trunk and actually she is a beautiful doll herself and a lot of Mark Cherry pieces so for those who are tuning in that have uh, never seen a Hure face and are just learning about it for the first time can you explain Hure well Hure is is paramount in the the doll world before here earlier today we talked about paper machés and the here sisters saw paper machés and they felt that 
the body shapes of a paper mache were unrealistic and not pleasing to them. So they created a perfectly proportioned, uh, she's really a preteen, you know, just, this is the ladies' corner, but she is really actually a preteen. So they created a perfectly proportioned doll. It started out that you were supposed to dress your doll. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that this is a fact because we actually have a book that has a pattern for a here a uh, corsage, which would be a top. So they expected you to dress your own dolls. What happened is they were selling hirays to uh, the carriage trade, the wealthiest people in Paris. Those people didn't want to be bothered with that. So what happened is they decided, well, we should provide them with clothes. So the clothes actually became a bigger part of the business than actually the dolls. Because if you think about it, one doll has a wardrobe of 12 dresses and all the accessories. That's where the profit was. So, so this is really actually bar the same concept of Barbie, but like great, 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 great grandmother <laughs> Barbie. So it, it's, it's really important in doll history, but also important in the history of fashion dolls. And they were an extraordinary family. This wasn't a new concept of thinking about, let's go into business. They came from a family mm -hmm. that their, um, uh, their father was the, the um, made locks for the, uh, Napoleon the Third, so they, you know, they uh, they were an uh, you know a, a industrial family. So the second shelf is just this is hair raising. This is Mimi, <laughs> and um, Mimi. Mimi and Mimi is Mimi is a, a uh, she's not just a visitor. She's always here. So Mimi is again a first generation here and with the original gutta percha body. And she has a wonderful col collection of clothing. And she kind of has a very special provenance because she came from a, a family, a French family that were, were actually related to the Spencers, Diana, Princess Diana's family. Wow. So she has a very, very, you know, special provenance and, um, many marked pieces of clothing. Um, Just phenomenal. Uh, but what's in her case that's probably the most rarest thing in the whole wide world is this Hire Jardinier. Look at that. And they made these in full size and they also made them in miniature for the Hire dolls. And a Jardinier is basic, it's a plant stand. You'd put a palm in it or a, you know, some kind of mm -hmm. live plant but it's a really very rare piece. And normally, I, we've, I've, we have never taken this anywhere. But Louise Hedrick is one of our um, big supporters and done many, many workshops. And the last one she, for us, and the last one she did was here. And we knew that it would be the last one that she would do here. And she asked to see that. So I very carefully brought that out of the house, <laughs> which, you know, if you break it or anything it's happens to it, it cannot be replaced. No. Not for any amount of money. Amazing. But Just here's fabulous. a one, this really is a, if you look at it as a wonderful study in here clothes, all of these pieces, we have to be very honest, they were not the only ones made. These were like Barbies, so there have been multiple, you could buy the Bluebird of Happiness dress like this, this, you know, many people had this dress. But this is 160 years ago. Amazing. And so as time goes by, this might be the only one that's left. Oh, it looks like the fabric that's in your apartment upstairs. It's just yeah, it's fabulous. kind of like a twally yeah. kind of a, 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 but it's called the Bluebird of Happiness. And we, we had a small swatch of, um, this in a pinky, pinky red tone that came off of a Hure bed. Mm. And we are having that reproduced. Because Wonderful. Because there's not enough of this for everybody to have stuff. Now you've touched on a couple times a first generation. How many generations of Hure? Oh, there's there? a gazillion. Because once at this period in time, what you wanted to do is you wanted to have innovation. That's what set you apart. So one year you have these straight arms. And then the next year you think, well, well, we'll have them bent at the elbow. 
because then we have a new product to sell somebody. And then the wrist and so on and so on. And then the styles change. It went from China to bisque, bisque painted eye, then bisque glass eyed and uh, swivel neck. So you've got many, many, think of any kind of industry where you have to improve your product in order to attract a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they started this, it was like a floodgate that opened up that other people um, started making dolls. And really, I, it, there's a, it's important to study history if you collect something. If you take Napoleon III out of history, there's no doll industry. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that Napoleon III did was they had the Houseman Project, which was literally tearing down the slums of Paris, which basically had not changed pre-revolution, 1793. It hadn't changed. Without the change, there wasn't the facilities to, to take up shop, to make shops, to, and it created a boom, a luxury boom, and it also gave people opportunities to, you know, if money's flowing, it creates a whole um, supply and demand, and it was just that one special, special, really like an 18-year period of incredible movement at that ultimately led to the golden age of dolls. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to give Napoleon III and Empress Eugenie and Baron Haussmann and all the people that are involved in it credit for that. Because the Paris you see today is the Paris that they created. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you went back, uh, you know, 1825, you'd be probably be horrified. And part of that was, it was economics, um, those kind of pro projects are fantastic economics, economically, but also too, the, the Parisians love a good march and they love a good destroying the city. And by having the wide boulevards where they could control it, it helped stabilize things. But out of that came this wonderful doll boom. Wonderful doll boom. Besides the doll boom, the fashion boom, because really after the French Revolution, um, you know, it decimated the the luxury good um, that, that France had for hundreds of years before. So really, Napoleon III revitalized everything. Very underappreciated world leader, by the way. If you guys are just tuning in, we are here live at the Grovian Doll Museum here in Pacific Grove with Michael Canadas. We are having a fabulous program on the Ladies' Corner, which features hirays, French fashions, all kinds of wonderful, and, luscious and lady really dolls. And really on what I was just talking about with Napoleon III and the White Boulevards and all of that, it's a perfect segue into turning around and looking at Mademoiselle Marie, because here we're now about 1868, the Second Empire is what it's known as, is full throttle. They are so incredibly rich. They have these beautiful parks, beautiful promenades, and abundance of materials to make gowns, and they literally became party floats. Look at that. So we're in, this is Mademoiselle Marie, and she's 1868, and these dresses are enormous. They're as much longer than she is tall. So they're just a kind of an amazing thing. Just captivating the face on that doll. It's she, just wonderful. I, thought, I think that if you stared at her long enough, you would become hypnotized. And she was retailed by uh, Maison Guillard, which was the toy seller to the Imperial Prince. And that was the son, young son of Napoleon III and Empress Eugenie. Look at that. So these would be the, these costumes are not exaggerated dolly costumes. These are what you would have seen at that time walking down the street or in uh, the Jardin de Luxembourg or, or any of the um, beautiful parks. Just incredible. We have people commenting saying it's overwhelming. It is when you see all of these well, things Well, it's in one better spot. to be overwhelmed than <laughs> underwhelmed. <laughs> I would say so. So wonderful. And then beneath, is this an extension of 
her wardrobe? This, this whole cabinet. This right entire here. cabinet. Yes, yes. This is all her things. Buckle up, everybody. And and this is the this is the first time. This is what's wonderful about us doing this boutique museum, is she was displayed in our home, but never these things. Mm -hmm. There was never really enough room for that. So we really, you know, it was nice. And she's gotten a lot of enjoyment here. And we'll take you over to the the red and green departments. All of these wonderful accessories, clothing, everything belongs to one doll. And she has wonderful, you know, the, a, a child didn't buy this in two seconds. They did this over a period of time. You would, you would get at that period in time, you'd get one doll and then you'd get new clothes or add things to it. Um, but, you know, it's, she's a wonderful piece. And then, you know, it's fun to obviously these display items did not come with her but you know I love miniature furniture so it's a nice thing to look for and helps kind of tell a story such a wonderful story if you guys are tuning in share the video so everyone can see this amazing display it's something that you just do not ever see and it's such and a Rachel, treat I want you to look at these her jewelry all this green jewelry look at that but my favorite pieces are such a rare color yes it is and, um, you know, there was a period in time in the, I think, the 50s and 60s where people thought that green, not maybe not the 60s, but that green was like a bad luck color mm. and don't buy green glass. I don't listen to any of that because who, I mean, here's Madame Mazel Marie's em, <laughs> quote in quotes, emerald earrings. So and what is interesting about her is she does not have pierced ears. What they would do is they would hang the earrings from her wig. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, they just hang it from the wig. Very interesting. Look at and this is a beautiful little print. This is one of her wrappers. But look at that little tiny trim. It's just a neat, neat bit of trim. Very so special. Wonderful. And she does have more dresses than this, but it does. <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. She has uh, four sections of this cabinet here at the at, in the ladies' corner. No, and and then of course. Again, we were talking about undergarments. You can see here her corset. And I should tell you that, you know, a lot of people think today that a, the corset, at this period in time, this was not necessarily a torture device. Mm -hmm. They were at the still what we would call a natural waistline. What the corset did is it smoothed everything out and it also gave support because the brassiere has not been been uh, designed yet to support for your bosom. Um, but so it is a natural body shape. What made the, the waist look so tiny was that the skirts were so enormous. Mm. So it was an it really was an illusion. If you find an original ladies' garment from this time period, you find that they're not they're not minuscule like say an 1890s piece where where they were really kind of torturing women with that. So wonderful. Michael, thank you for sharing thank this you. wonderful exhibit over here. Uh, can you tell our viewers that are tuning in live, we have a lot of them, what they can look forward to next? Well, I think the next thing that we're going to do is uh, fantastic, the art of being cool. We're so excited. Thank you again. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.